And Sarah, you are recording as well, right? Yep, right before we begin, I'll record. Yep. Chris? Shannon, are you good? Yes, we are live. Okay. All right, Sarah, anytime if you want to start recording. We're good. Yep. Okay. All right, we want to welcome you all to our media briefing here today on the 21st of April. We're talking today about testing. Uh, you are seeing right now all of these panelists shoulder to shoulder because this is a huge collaboration in our community. But we are going to uh, take people out and only show you folks who are speaking so that it's easier for you to record this and use this, um, our media friends, uh, later as you need to. So we're going to ask all of our panelists, except for our commission president, Tina Skeldon Wozniak, to please now turn off their cameras and media you will be allowed to ask questions to any of our panelists after our news briefing today and we begin now with our commission president tina skeldon wozniak thank you so much chris i'm so happy to be a part of this press conference that's so important for our community uh, so in behalf of my colleagues uh, pete gherkin and gary byers and also i'm so happy to be joined um, with Mayor Wade Kapsikevich today too, um, to tell you that we have some good news to share with our residents of Toledo and Lucas County. Uh, while we are still all um, dealing and under the uh, stay at home order, um, at, least, at least until May 1st, um, we are planning for the future. Um, and in this roadmap to recovery, testing is an important highway to give us data that we can use to move forward safely. We're so grateful. Um, we, today we're um, sharing with you an amazing public-private uh, partnership. So uh, we have great community retail partners uh, together with the Neighborhood Health Association, who, are, who is going to also share about the public side of this testing. Uh, and how we can begin the meaningful public testing in our area. Uh, so thank you to all the community partners who are going to bring you important information to, uh, today and how we can move together to ensure the safety and well-being of all of our Lucas County residents. So thank you and let's hear some more. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And we will let you turn your camera off and give our health commissioner, Dr. Eric Jasinski, uh, time to turn his on. And you're gonna tell us, Commissioner, um, why this testing is so important for our area. Chris, thank you so much. And, and again, this is a day for Lucas County and our community. Uh, it, you know, we started this process uh, several, several weeks ago without having a test and we had to a couple of strategy we've, we've been using uh, to use that tool we didn't have. We have a, a very significant tool to help combat this nefarious disease that we have out there. The, the idea of testing, uh, as we've seen in other countries, uh, they were able to test themselves out of a uh, COVID issue where we did not have the ability. So we're going to start having the ability to understand what's going on in our community, like uh, Commissioner Wozniak discussed. Uh, is going to give us a, a much better tool and a better panel on getting to the root cause of that. that really is to make sure that people who are infected can, can not infect others or we, we limit that ability for them to infect others. That is really the way that we're going to, again, stop this disease. So as we know that more people are, are positive, we then can go ahead and self-quarantine uh, self them, look at their contacts. If they get sick, we can react to that. So it's going to give our church, our contact box much more uh, ability to, again, stem hopefully the tide of infection going out through the community. Data is so important um, from the health, health department's perspective. We're all trying to figure out what's going on out there, and that's because of that data. Um, and with 
the ability to test more, be able to have a better handle on that data and understand where we need to uh, resources, uh, but then also then to make sure that that messaging that we so much need in health get out the right way. So Chris, I is really uh, testing in, in, in a nutshell what we do and why it's so important. Okay, thank you so much. And now we wanna bring into the conversation someone who can explain to us um, a little more about kind of the logistics of testing. ProMedica has been a big partner in us getting the um, word out and there is a hotline you'll hear about in just a little bit as well. So we wanna bring in Dr. Brian Kaminsky to the conversation. He's the Vice President of Quality and Safety for ProMedica Health. And I think it's natural, Dr. Kaminsky, that everybody just wants to be tested to find out, do I have it or have I had it? But in this particular round of testing, we really are looking for some very specific parameters of who can get tested. So why don't you tell us about that and why that's so important? Sure, and, and thank you for having me. And uh, we all understand how important it is to test and the health commissioner outlined a number of those reasons. Uh, testing helps us drive public policy, I think is probably the, the most important reason, uh, but yet that we, we know as individuals that we all um, would like to be tested because we would like to know if we've been exposed and we would like to know if, uh, if we have the disease, if we have symptoms. And uh, it's important to talk about those two different things because uh, there isn't an infinite amount of testing out there. So we're really exciting that through this public and private partnership, we're able to uh, offer more tests to more people in our community because it is going to create learning and create knowledge. It's going to help us understand the disease prevalence within our community, uh, and it's going to help us uh, target hot spots, and it's going to help drive public policy and help us eventually ease some of those restrictions that are out there. But it's really important to understand the limits of the testing. So the test that we're all referring to right now uh, it's a molecular test. And what that means is that we're testing for components of the virus that that individual might be shedding at the time that we see the person. So it doesn't necessarily equate with the disease and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're contagious. What it does mean is that uh, you've either recently contracted the disease or that uh, you're uh, most recently recovering from the disease. So that's what we uh, are currently testing for. And it's also important to point out that the test itself, whether the result be positive or negative, is unlikely to affect the recommendations that we have for that individual. So as you've heard many of times, uh, our recommendations are to stay home, to uh, self-isolate, and to abide by all those restrictions that are in place right now that's um, keeping people at home and keeping people isolated. Uh, whether you test positive or negative, we still want to enforce those recommendations because the test itself is imperfect. We know that about 25% of people don't have symptoms at all. And we also know that about 25% of people will test negative when they actually have the disease. So the, the, the test itself has its limits. The good news is that for those people who do test positive, they are very likely to have or have recently recovered from the disease. So our positives are true positives, but our negatives, uh, there are too many false negatives to completely rely on testing alone to drive behaviors and to drive uh, public policy. But the positive tests in their aggregate allow us to understand the prevalence of the disease in our community. So because there aren't an infinite number of tests out there and to truly understand how much disease is in our community, really prioritizing uh, our testing in a way that's consistent with state and national recommendations. We want to test people who are symptomatic. They're the most likely individuals to result in a positive test if indeed it is COVID disease. And that will give us the best understanding of disease prevalence in our community and allow us to to feed that information back into our local health department, into our state health departments, and then eventually across the country so that we can make responsible decisions and informed decisions about when to loosen and ease restrictions as we begin to reopen the country. And one of the reasons that they are starting to report these probable cases is because if you do have those symptoms at this time, you probably are a COVID patient, is that correct? Yeah, we have such disease prevalence out there that um, COVID is a very likely illness if you have the appropriate symptoms. 
The main symptoms that we see from the illness are fever, cough, shortness of breath sometimes, muscle aches, body aches, and then less commonly, um, uh, you get gastrointestinal symptoms. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, those are present in about 15% of the population. Okay, Dr. Kaminsky, thank you so much for being here with us and stand by, we'll have you turn your camera on, but please stand by to answer some questions. There are three retail partners in our area that are going to be part of this testing um, process, including Kroger, Rite Aid, and Walmart. And in fact, Rite Aid actually began testing yesterday. So we're going to ask Jeffrey Mazinski, the regional pharmacy leader for Rite Aid, to join us now to tell us how the testing is going and what those parameters are that Rite Aid is putting into place. Hi, Jeffrey. Well, Chris, thank you for uh, in inviting me to this conference. Uh, Rite Aid is very proud to be part of this uh, as a community effort to, to help in this testing pro procedures. Um, you know, we're working in conjunction with HHS, the White House Task Force, and uh, CDC, obviously, in getting this testing uh, done. Um, it is all done by appointment. Uh, yesterday was our first day on, on site, and we tested 90 individuals. Today, we're, we're potentially going to test up to 200 people. And starting tomorrow, we're ramping up our testing volume up to 400 people in the day. Uh, we've got a pretty uh, good system going, almost a well-oiled machine right now. And it's work, worked out very well. There's a lot of great attitudes and uh, everybody is, is working in a collaborative manner to get it done. Okay, and you actually had how many people Yesterday, through yesterday, your we tested 90, 90 people. Uh, the results in, of our test are sent to a, an outside healthcare firm called PWN, and they will get the results back to the patient. In they say two to seven days, we are hearing reports it's closer to the two day mark. If they are positive, they'll get a phone call from a, a member of the clinical team at PWN. If they are negative, they'll get a response on email only. And, uh, and you have already um, had people make appointments for the next several days ahead, correct? Right, what we, the way it works is people will go to writeaid.com, our website, and there's a link to uh, COVID-19 testing. We work with a company called Verily, which is a division of uh, Google Alphabet, to uh, handle the logistics of the, the screening questionnaire and the scheduling of the appointments. And every day we schedule through one o'clock today for appointments for the next day. And if the next day fills out, then we, we continue going on down the line. But the last time I checked uh, a little while ago, we were full until about three o'clock tomorrow and we're open till five. So there's still some slots open for tomorrow, but that, that got cut off at one o'clock today. Um, it, it's a very simple questionnaire. I've done it myself. We're prioritizing, obviously, CDC priority number one and number two, uh, first responders, healthcare workers, people over 65 that are symptomatic. And uh, this, the questionnaire is very simple to fill out and uh, complete it. And then you get an, almost an instantaneous response of your eligibility and then be offered a couple time slots that uh, may work out for you. Uh, to test. And then we, uh, we have people drive in, come to the test site, show a government ID, plus a verification of the appointment. Uh, the appointment, uh, they can either show us their phone or a printout from their appointment confirmation. We are enforcing the date of the appointment. If somebody happens to be a half hour late or a half hour early, we're not worried about that. But if you're scheduled for April 22nd, it, we can only process it on April 22nd because the requisitions are specific for a given date. Uh, but uh, we're ramping up and excited to help in this matter. And Jeffrey, just um, to be clear, this is you make an appointment, you do this as a drive-through through your drive-through um, location, and you this is a nose swab. Right, it's, it's a self-administered nasal swab under the supervision of one of our pharmacists that we're trained. Uh, there's virtually no patient contact. Almost all of it is done with closed car windows with the exception of when we have to give the kit 
to the patient and that's done at the end of a six foot table. So we maintain that distance. Um, and then we do a demonstration on how to do it and uh, send the people on their way. And it's worked out very, very well. You know, every now and then somebody will drop a, drop a swab, drop a test tube, and then we have to you know, get another kit taken care of. But uh, we have had very few problems, uh, great attitudes from both our associates and the public at large, and it's worked out very well so far. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here with us today, uh, Jeffrey from Rite Aid, and he'll stand by to take questions as well. And now we want to bring in our other uh, retail partner right now. Um, starting on Thursday, Kroger will be administering tests in our area. So Kroger's regional clinical director, Connie Palekadetti, excuse me, will talk about Kroger's effort in our community. Hi, Connie. Hi, thank you for having me today. Um, Kroger is really excited to announce the beginning of our testing for COVID-19 this Thursday, April 23rd. We will be offering drive-through COVID testing. We have partnered with the Lucas County Health Department for a chosen location that best serves our community's needs. We're going to be located at the Metro Park Hawkins Farmhouse located at 5434 West Bancroft Street for testing. Our testing will run um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, so April 23rd through the 25th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We do anticipate that we will be testing about 1,000 patients over these next three days who meet the criteria established by the CDC. Kroger and Kroger Health are focusing on testing for priority one and two and also now have expend, expanded to priority three. So testing for the community that's out there. So anyone with symptoms of COVID-19 can be tested at our sites free of cost. In order to make an appointment for testing at our sites, someone would need to visit www.krogerhealth.com backslash COVID testing you will then go through a virtual screening to help you figure out whether or not you are a candidate for our testing protocol per CDC guidelines. If the assessment determines that you do need that testing, um, the next step would be to choose the testing location and an appointment time. After you do that, you would then receive a confirmation email of your appointment. Our drive-through testing locations are also a self-administered nasal swab that is ordered and observed by a provider that is on site for Kroger Health. These test results are available within 48 hours from the date of testing for the patient as well as Lucas County. Kroger has determined that this testing of methodology is beneficial because it increases the amount of tests that we can provide for the communities, but also limits the amount of personal protective equipment that needs to be utilized. So we're saving some PPE. Kroger and Kroger Health is committed to expanding our drive-through testing sites and other locations to provide all the vital needs in our communities with COVID-19. This allows us to continue our mission, vision, and purpose to help people live healthier lives by simplifying healthcare. It's just that easy. These drive-through sites, um, you drive up, you have your appointment time, you get your swab and move on, and therefore we will be able to call those results to you within 48 hours. So thank you for having us. We look forward to caring for many of you at our sites this week. Thank you so much, Connie, and thanks for being here and stand by uh, as you might get some questions. We also want to let you know that a Walmart representative was not able to be here with us this afternoon, but Walmart will be taking over the testing site at the Metro Parks Hawkins Farmhouse site on Bancroft beginning on Wednesday of next week. Again, there are parameters. You have to make an appointment. We'll give all that information to you in uh, just a moment. Our media friends should be receiving it um, via email any moment now. Again, um, we want to let you know that this data is very important for our area, and the Ohio Department of Health has really been pushing for this information as they make decisions, and they have also made testing kits available to all the health departments in Ohio counties, and so Health Commissioner Eric Jasinski will talk about how those test kits will be used and administered. Commissioner? Hey, Chris. Uh, as you see, uh, the increase in testing is coming, uh, and then that includes uh, for ODH as well. Uh, ODH is pushing out uh, 
us to all health departments, uh, including the, the Cleveland Lucas County Health Department. And so we're, we're very grateful for that. Uh, again, this will continue uh, for, uh, for the immediate future. Uh, there is a limited supply, though, uh, from the Ohio Department of Health, so that we'll go ahead and as we receive those, we'll be able to put those out. What we really looked at was uh, how are we going to start pushing these out to the public? And one of, uh, one of our main concerns here is the underserved population. We've heard the issues of the underserved population, specifically the African-American community and the, uh, the disparities that are there. And what we really needed to do is, is figure out what was happening in those communities, or more importantly, again, pushing some of these tests out to that underserved population. And we are so lucky to have Donnie Miller with the Neighborhood Health Association uh, with us to be able to, uh, again, really look at this underserved population and try to make sure that doing everything we possibly can to, to, to find out what's going on in that community. The, the tests uh, we have right now are about 400 that, that Doc, uh, Donnie Miller will be able to go ahead and actually uh, utilize uh, for, for a set criteria of, of that underserved population. And what I'd like to do is uh, ask uh, Donnie Miller to uh, come on screen and, and just talk about where we're going with this, the criteria, and uh, what uh, Neighborhood Health Association is actually going to be able to do for the community. Thanks, Eric. Really, thank you so much for this partnership. First of all, I'd like everybody to know that this is an incredible initiative and it would not have been possible without the strong collaboration of the city and the county and the community, which is so important in these kinds of conversations, TPD and both Mercy and Comedica hospitals. Um, we are all completely and totally committed uh, to the importance of testing in this community. And I am thrilled to say also to bringing testing to those underserved in this community. We will become by offering testing to the underserved one of the precious few in this country to have actually placed COVID-19 testing sites squarely within the reach of those most vulnerable to this illness. What you see today is, is the best example of how teamwork makes uh, the dream work. So Neighborhood Health Association is, is thrilled to be a part of this. We'd like to especially thank, while well, I have a minute to say this publicly, Eric and uh, Matt Sapara for helping NHA manage the millions of pieces that are required by this process. You know, it's really fitting um, that NHA be in this position today. This organization was started 50 years ago by a group of African Americans in the central city who were frustrated by the number um, within their community who were dying uh, because of a lack of healthcare, um, adequate access to healthcare and from diseases that could have otherwise been handled had they simply had access to healthcare. So here we are 50 years later with the Neighborhood Health Association in partnership with those folks that I've talked about already bringing this very important testing to those very communities. And I know they would be proud of, of what this community has done in response to their dream. Let me tell you a little bit about how the Neighborhood Health Association will proceed. We will um, be providing tests at both, both walk-in and drive-up testing to, um, at, at two of our sites, the Nexus Healthcare location which is located at 1415 Jefferson Avenue and our Navarre Park Family Health Center, which is located inside of the East Toledo Family Center at 1020 Varland Avenue. We will have um, translation services in Spanish available at the Varland uh, Park site. Testing will begin at 9 a.m. Uh, this Monday, April 27th, and it will conclude at 3 p.m. on that day. We will be testing regularly on Monday through Friday um, during those same hours, 9 to 3, um, until the tests are no longer available. And right now, we're not able to tell you when that might be. We will be testing symptomatic residents of the following zip codes, um, 43602, 43604, 43605, 06, 07, 08, 09, 10, 11, 
20 and some portions of the Holland zip code 4852, 43528, I'm sorry. Again, that's 43528. As with um, most places that are providing uh, testing, you will be required to have an appointment. Appointments can be made by calling 419-214-5700. Now, what's important to know about that is that you cannot start, uh, we will not start taking appointments for the testing until this Friday, which I think is the 24th, at um, one o'clock in the afternoon. If anybody calls prior to that, they will simply be requested to call back at, um, at a later time. Spanish translation will also be available um, for the making of appointment. To help defray the cost of these tests, we will be billing insurance if that is available. But if it's not, don't worry about it. The, the, the cost of the test will be covered. So those of you in those vulnerable populations that we are talking about, please, please, please do not let your inability to pay, do not let your inability um, to uh, have insurance keep you from getting tested. Please use this opportunity um, to be tested. And also keep in mind, everyone, um, that while NHA is targeting specific zip codes, the county, as you've heard, is well situated to provide testing to almost anyone in the, in the county who needs it. The reason that we are targeting these zip codes is because the, the disparity in the numbers of African Americans and brown people and poor people who are contracting these, the, this, this illness are so far and away above those of any other group of folks who are getting this disease. And we are clear, everyone on this call is clear, all of our partners are clear, that unless we get a handle on the spread of this disease in these communities, we are in trouble for a very long time. So again, lots of appreciation to our partners on this call. Those of you out there, please remember that for Neighborhood Health Association, we are specifically targeting those folks in the zip code that I've mentioned. Those are the zip codes that contain the um, highest number of residents who are black, brown, and underserved in our county, um, and an appointment is required. Donnie, thank you for everything you did to pull this together for our community. We appreciate that so much. You are welcome. We want to go ahead and show you the graphic now uh, that shows all of these locations where we have uh, put these testing sites so that you can see them. Um, there are four of them at a time. Um, as you heard there, the first is going to be the Rite Aid on Airport Highway in Holland. RiteAid.com is the address there. The second is the Metro Parks Hawkins Farmhouse that was sponsored by Kroger on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this week. KrogerHealth.com slash COVID testing is the website to get there. The third is the Nexus Healthcare Center downtown on Jefferson and 419-214. 5700 is the number to call to make an appointment. And then the Navarre Park Family Care Center inside the East Toledo Family Center at 1020 Varland. And again, the phone number 419-214-5700. In all cases, you must be showing symptoms of COVID-19 and you also must make an appointment at each of these places. The Metro Parks Hawkins Farmhouse uh, will be taken over by Walmart, the testing there on Wednesday of next week. Um, that website uh, we will put into the comments. Uh, our media should have it, but we'll put it in the comments on our Facebook page as well, so you can see that. And obviously uh, a lot of collaboration here uh, between a lot of different uh, industries and a lot of different folks, including uh, Mercy Health. And Matt Sapara is the Vice President of Regional Development and Operations at Mercy. He's here with some additional information now. Matt. Good afternoon, Chris. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying uh, to Donnie, Donnie, what an honor and privilege it is for Mercy Health to be uh, partnering with you to ensure that the most uh, 
the most underserved and vulnerable in our community are um, are tested, you know, during this pandemic. We are, we're so honored to be part of that partnership. But my message really is one of gratitude and unity. Um, you know, thank you to Walmart and Kroger and Rite Aid for expanding the community's ability to test our residents. Um, we know how valuable it is to get this data um, to ensure you know, we know who has it and who doesn't at this point. I also want to say thank you to our partners, UTMC, uh, St. Luke's, ProMedica, who've been with us now for the last several weeks in testing uh, population centers here in Lucas County. Um, you know, very early on, we recognized the need to move forward in that direction, and we've been busy doing that. Mercy Health and its partner, ProMedica, stand ready to support the expansion of testing capability through the use of our established hotlines. I believe those numbers are going to be shown on the screen here shortly. Um, but again, whatever we can do to help support you know, this mission to expand the testing capabilities to ensure that everyone that is symptomatic, as, as Dr. Kaminsky indicated, um, is being tested. Because again, that information is so valuable. I also want to take a second to thank all of our first responders throughout the region. You know, Mercy, Mercy Health has partnered with both law enforcement and EMS agencies to ensure that all first responders are tested where appropriate. And we're very grateful for the relationships that we have to ensure these men and women are protected. With the expansion of this relationship, Mercy Health has been able to work with some of the largest law enforcement agencies in the community to ensure that they've properly fitted um, N95 masks. Um, once again, something that we may have taken for granted in the past, but today we recognize how important that is. And we really think that that's a testament to, um, compared to other communities, how few people are quarantined right now from the first responder perspective. I specifically want to reach out and say thank you to Chief Crawl, Chief Bird, as well as Sheriff Tharp and all the fire chiefs that have uh, stepped forward um, and demonstrated their leadership to make sure that these uh, these groups are protected. And finally, I just, I'd just i be remiss if I didn't say thank you to all of our healthcare heroes at every location, in every discipline. Um, you know, I get to see it firsthand, seeing what these men and women are doing to help protect you know, our community and working with the people that have been afflicted with this horrible disease. I think when uh, this pandemic is finally defeated, the role of the healthcare workers um, just simply cannot be overstated. We are so blessed to have these, these heroes walking amongst us. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Matt. And you are absolutely right. We owe a debt of gratitude to all of our healthcare heroes in our community, as well as uh, other workers on the front line who are making sure we're all safe. And it's that kind of collaboration of all of those workers that has really helped to ensure the safety of people in Toledo and Lucas County. And Toledo Mayor Wade Kapstikavich has been a huge part of that equation and has a few remarks about this latest collaboration here today. Hi, Mayor. Hi, Chris, and hello to everyone joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm in a position really to reiterate what so many others have said, and that is a general thank you to all of the partners who made this happen. I, I wanna pause and reflect on the significance of today's announcement. Matt Sapera is absolutely right. Because of the leadership Mercy has shown, we've been able to test uh, first responders. Uh, Mercy has uniquely uh, stepped up to make sure our, our first responders and others have had uh, access to testing and uh, the other resources they need uh, to, to protect themselves. I, I think back to the, uh, the night at the airport where half a million masks came in. I know Mercy was integral in making that happen as well. Um, the, the, the significant thing today though, is that now uh, we are going to be able uh, to offer uh, public testing in a way that uh, we hadn't been, frankly, uh, maybe this time last week. And as Donnie Miller mentioned, perhaps in a way that uh, not many other communities in the country uh, are able to say. Um, it, it's not worth, I suppose, litigating um, the last several months of this crisis, but I, I do think most would agree that the um, there, there has not been as much a one federal response as there have been 50 state responses and perhaps thousands of local responses. And so it really uh, has fallen to local communities uh, to be resilient uh, and to be um, creative in how we were going to meet certain needs. That's just the reality of how the, the response has unfolded. We have, as Donnie mentioned, I think done better than most communities in this country in terms of being able to get our hands on some testing uh, to make it available to the public at large uh, in a way that is not perfect, 
Uh, I'm sure this plan is not perfect. Nothing about the situation we are in in this country right now is perfect. Uh, but we do, we are providing access to testing for the public. Uh, it will go on for several weeks. Um, it's going to uh, uh, provide testing opportunities to historically uh, underserved uh, and vulnerable communities uh, in a way that not many other cities in this country can say uh, on April 21st, 2020. I assure you of that. We're a little bit ahead of the game here. And that is a great credit to all of our partners. Um, again, I think part of what I've learned uh, over the last several weeks is that it is pretty easy uh, to flip a switch and turn things off, uh, turn the economy off, turn society off. You know, when you have the president of the United States and 50 different governors uh, uh, ordering people to stay at home, that, you know, in that way, you can pretty quickly and swiftly turn things off. It's not gonna be as easy to turn things back on, not at all. It's going to take several weeks, if not months, if not longer, who knows? We really don't know how long it'll take, but we know that the slow process of getting back to something resembling normal can only happen with testing. It can only happen with testing. And in the last week or so, uh, there's been a lot of discussion locally, statewide and nationally about, uh, about uh, you know, the timeline of, of when things are gonna get back to something resembling normal. We see some states and you know, in Georgia, they're opening restaurants back again and other states and communities have really started to talk about, um, uh, you know, how soon we can get back to how we were and, and uh, what that will look like. Well, whatever the answer to those questions are begins with testing. None of it can happen. We can't go back to anything resembling normal uh, without testing. And so that is why I am so thankful for the partners involved here today, uh, the health department, uh, Mercy, ProMedica, uh, UTMC, St. Luke's, um, uh, Neighborhood Health Association, and, and really most especially uh, the three uh, private companies. The private sector has stepped up and helped us in a way that, you know, maybe in an alternate uh, history, the federal government could have done, but no sense crying over spilled milk now. I'm, I'm certainly uh, fortunate, glad. I, I just feel very fortunate that we have uh, corporate citizens like Kroger uh, and Walmart and Rite Aid who are, are filling the gap and uh, taking the lead on this. So for the next, for the foreseeable future, next several weeks, there will be public testing available to all members of our community. And that is an incredibly important step as we talk about uh, returning uh, to, to something resembling normal. So again, thank you everyone. And, and I'm uh, happy to participate in this conversation. Thank you, Mayor. And we'd like to open now to questions from our media partners. You can put those questions in the chat, uh, or if you would like to raise your hand and ask a question of someone, you can do that. And we can give you um, permission to ask your own question. Melissa Vach from 13 ABC has a question. Mel, go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask your question. It's okay. I got three quick questions for Eric Skajinski, who is the health commissioner. Um, first of all, uh, if, with all of this testing available, do we really have that many people out there who are still walking around COVID positive who, you know, who don't know it? And do you see this as, you know, exploding our local numbers? Second question is uh, nursing homes. Um, we're still looking for a release of information as to how hard our nursing homes are getting hit and what we're doing to protect our patients inside those nursing homes. So I guess it's two questions. Okay. Uh, the first one, uh, we do know that we have asymptomatic people walking around uh, with COVID. Uh, we, we, have the, uh, we have this idea of prevalence in the community, whether it's, it, it's you know, uh, of asymptomatic individuals of five to 10, um, you know, there, there's been upwards of saying 50%, we, we don't know. Uh, so what, what this is gonna do is a couple things. One, I do believe that there's still people that are, are symptomatic that could be out there. Um, and I do believe that there's asymptomatic individuals. Um, so what we're gonna be able to do here is again, if those individuals do have those symptoms and some of them might be slight, we're gonna be able to get a, a much better read on our community, what is happening relative to the COVID issues um, and the, uh, the idea of um, what we can do then to go forward. So that's really, that's why it's so important. 
The main issue though with the testing right now, at least from the public health standpoint, is that we want to catch all those individuals who would be who be testing positive. So again, we could stop that spread uh, by by uh, quarantining, isolating that individual, but then looking at those contacts so that it can't be spread further. Again, this thing, um, as we've talked about so many times, and I'll continue to, to state this, it is such a, a fast driving disease because of the asymptomatic issues and also how infectious it is that any tool that we can get into our community to help stop that, the better off we are. Let me move on to the nursing homes. Um, you know, there, there's been so much talk about the nursing homes in our community throughout the state, throughout the country, and it is a, it is a population that um, is, it is right to have issues uh, because of not only the, uh, the, the, the criteria and characteristics of the nursing home, uh, of those individuals in the nursing home, but then just, just the way that the process has happened there. So again, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue uh, that we all have to struggle with. Um, I will let you know internally inside of Lucas County, we have partnered with, uh, again, the, the same partners that we're talking about today, uh, all the hospitals um, have, uh, have, come, uh, have come up to, uh, to bat to help us with the issue inside the nursing homes. Uh, that, uh, that includes uh, some, some testing, uh, includes help with looking at infection control pr uh, practices. Uh, also then too, uh, the Ohio Department of Health uh, has had a, a number of conference calls with us and um, local nursing homes to look at those very issues as well too. Uh, to actually walk through to see how we can help improve the uh, the situation inside those nursing homes, and also then too, um, CDC uh, is making visits uh, throughout the state of Ohio for nursing homes, and again, uh, trying to figure out how we can help all these nursing homes uh, combat the issues that they have internally. Uh, do we have a lot of cases? Do we have? Well, I, we we have uh, we have a number of nursing homes that have cases, both of. Uh, residents as well as workers. Um, the, the number last week was indicative of that. Uh, as we go through and look at the data, uh, more and more individuals are presenting with, um, with COVID symptoms and are positive. Uh, I, I think too, as we see, which is a good thing, uh, we're seeing additional testing inside of nursing homes, good and bad. We're gonna be able to get a better handle on what's happening in the nursing homes. Again, much like the community, inside the nursing homes, if you don't know who's positive, you can't separate those individuals out. To, so that they don't spread that disease. Um, there are several nursing homes that have uh, tested uh, wholesale and we'll be able to hopefully get some, some better information here in the next couple of days of what's happening in several of those nursing homes. Again, it's really important to look at that testing because uh, again, you can make assumptions of, of who's symptomatic of course, but then you can't make assumptions of uh, again, who might be asymptomatic or symptoms that are um, just not as severe. So again, this is going to help the nursing homes and us uh, combat those issues inside of those, those nursing homes and long-term care, uh, long care facilities. Thank you. Sure. Next, we have uh, Roxanne Elias from WTOL. Roxanne, if you can turn on your microphone, please ask your question. Okay, I believe I turned it on. Can you we guys can hear you. Um, I wanted to ask, I guess, the testing sites, are there any of the testing sites that will also make um, translations available for the Spanish speaking communities or the Arabic communities? Or is it only the one location that Neighborhood Health Association has that will offer just Spanish translation for those who come in for testing? Neighborhood Health Association has um, let me turn my camera on for you. Neighborhood Health Association will have Spanish translation um, at the appointment time. So you will we'll certainly be able to um, address the issue of the need for translation as you make appointments. And we will also have uh, translation at the Navarre site. We are investigating um, providing other languages as well, Arabic being one of them. It's a little more complicated, so we're not starting out with those, but it's our hope to add the, the ability to translate um, for other languages pretty soon. Okay, and then um, this is, I guess, for the health commissioner. Are you guys getting a lot of calls from the, I mean, I know you guys are talking about the underserved communities, but these are also the people that can only speak one language. How are you guys, what kind of questions or concerns are you guys getting from those communities at, at the health department? Um, 
we're not seeing a, a lot of that at this point in time. It's, it is sporadic. And uh, again, I think it goes back to what Donnie Miller is attempting to do uh, again, setting up uh, that, that alternate language or that, 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 uh, that, that other language uh, other than English at the, at the site so that we can go ahead and make sure that it, it is covered across the community, that those individuals have a, a seamless ability to understand not only the testing procedure, but then what they need to do after the test if they are uh, found positive. Uh, so again, that that second that that second type of language on a community and or third language or fourth, as we we've done some Facebook Live um, uh, presentations uh, early on here, those are all important as well too. Um, and, and we we continue to to attempt to to address those throughout a lot of our flyers and things of that nature. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we have Brooks Sutherland from the Blade. Brooks, go ahead with your question. You guys hear me? Yes. All right, this is for Eric. So the mayor was just talking about public testing. Um, do we have a specific number of how many tests we now have in the county that would essentially reflect our capacity to test everyone that you know is showing symptoms or needs it? Well, uh, again, um, I would like to see a test for, for everybody in the community. Uh, but again, we're, we're looking at those, uh, the, the CDC guidance and understanding that that test really only is effective if you have symptoms. Uh, again, we won't get the asymptomatic issues. Uh, so uh, what I'm seeing right now is I'm seeing the uptick of, of tests. And if we're talking over the next month of, you know, it could be 10 to 15,000 tests if, if, if everybody stays on track with the, the numbers that we're projecting um, through, the, uh, through uh, Walmart and Kroger's and Rite Aid, that, that's going to be a, a substantial amount of tests. Um, is it enough? Uh, we won't know that until we, we go through the next month or so and see, uh, if you would, let's call it the background of COVID in our community. What are we seeing relative to those tests? Are they starting to decrease? Because again, we've talked about the possibility of this virus uh, reacting to uh, warmer temperatures and more humidity. Uh, so again, we don't know. All I can say is now we are thankful for the amount of tests that are coming in. It's, it's like uh, the mayor said, it's so much better than it was last week. And I see us getting more and more tests as we go through the next couple of weeks, um, not only from, uh, pri from the from private industry, from corporations, but I do believe from um, ODH as well too. I'll, I'll just follow up kind of to that point. Um, it, a lot of talk around the nation even about um, reopening and, and if we have enough testing. Uh, if the governor opens here soon, you know, he's talked about May 1st and eventually getting to some sort of normalcy. Um, do you feel comfortable uh, where we're at in Lucas County with testing once things start reopening? Um, I'm more, I, I, let me just preface by this. I'm more comfortable today than I was uh, two days ago. I, I think as we go through the next couple of weeks, I will become more comfortable. Uh, the, the problem that, I'm, that I, I think we're going to encounter is that we, we have testing now. And again, we think that's, that's, a, a, that, that's a cover for us that we can now can go out and do other things that you know, we may not be positive. So I can go out and you know, go six foot closer than somebody and talk to them or go out to a gathering, but we can't, we can't think that way. We have got to stay steadfast in the idea just because we have testing just because we're going to open up hopefully May 1st or somewhere in that in that time frame, that we go away from social distancing, that we go back to the large parties, we start shopping without a uh, without a face covering. I mean, those are the things that we can't do. We have to we have to stay the course over over the next weeks to maybe months to make sure that again we don't allow COVID to come back into our community. Thank you. Okay, I want to bring um, Connie from Kroger back up on the screen. Connie, if you wouldn't mind um, putting your camera on. Thank you so much. Um, Roxanne Elias, you were asking about um, other languages, and Connie Kroger also has the ability to uh, help people with translation, correct? Yeah, correct. So at our sites um, for our Kroger testing, we will also have translation phones available that speak multiple different languages that we actually use inside of our clinics um, today. So those will be available at our testing sites also. Okay, Thanks. and then we had another question, Connie, um, uh, from Sophia Paracone, who's asking, is the Hawkins Farmhouse site open to non-Lucas County residents um, like the Rite Aid location is? Um, 
So are you taking non-Lucas County or just Lucas County residents there? We will take anybody who is symptomatic um, for our sites up to the thousand um, tests that we have currently. Okay, thank you so much. And then the other part of that um, question, Sophia, you were asking how long Walmart will be taking over um, that site for, and they plan to be there um, until the end of May or whenever testing um, can whittle down. So um, through the end of May is what they're planning for right now. Okay, uh, Amy Steigerwalt from WTOL also has a question. Amy? Hello. The um, question is probably for the health commissioner. Um, as we see more testing happen uh, now, uh, do you expect our numbers will increase and we may learn of some hot spots in our community? And I guess how will that affect, um, you know, allowing people to social distance mm -hmm. and allowing things to reopen? So that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I do expect us, uh, again, to see increase in positive cases, which then will increase those contacts, which then probably will increase those probable cases. Uh, so again, the, the important thing here is it's, it's not a good thing. Okay, let's just, let's just let's, let's cut to the chase. It's not a good thing to have positive individuals, but if we know where they're at and then we can go back and do that contact tracing. Um, and again, like we've been talking about, I've said a couple of times here, the ability for us to then isolate those individuals from others until the disease runs its course, the more that we have the capability of stopping this thing from running through our community. So again, when we start talking about positive cases, nobody wants to see positive cases, but when we do that, that's a good thing for public health because then we can start getting a better handle on what's going on in the community. And that's, we, we've fought this thing with one hand uh, tied behind our back. Uh, we really have. Uh, we've done a, a great job and it's because of this community that we've been able to combat it as much as we've been able to. But as we bring testing online, it, that's a very powerful tool for us to be able to, to react to COVID much better and to limit uh, the, the capability of this thing running through our community. Thank you. Okay, and while we're waiting for any other questions, uh, Commissioner, Health Commissioner Jasinski, we still want people to understand that if they are showing these symptoms, even if they don't go out and get tested, that they probably do have COVID and we're gonna count them in our probable cases. Um,